What's up, everybody, and welcome into the H&M Trucking Podcast. I hope everything's going well for you out there. Things are going great here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I am going to start off the show by saying uh, I am having allergies like nobody's business right now. If you are from the Pacific Northwest or you uh, have been around my neck of the woods this time of year, we are the grass seed capital of the world. And if you are allergic to grass like I am, that just means that uh, May, June are pretty much hell. I'll get through it. Don't worry about it. I just I, I'm, I'm thinking about those of you that are watching the video right now and looking at my glassy, watery eyes and wondering if I've been puffing on the devil's lettuce before I got here. The answer is no. Uh, I just can't breathe through two of the three holes on my face. So I apologize for a little bit of a nasally register and the watery eyes, but we're going to make it work. Uh, let's go ahead and hit the music. Maybe that'll give me a chance to blow my nose. From Omaha, Nebraska, to whatever lane you're driving, this is the H&M Trucking Podcast with your host, Marcus Bridges. On this week's episode of the pod, we are talking about the women behind H&M Trucking. And uh, I love this topic because it gives me an opportunity to brag about some of the women in my life. I brag about my wife all the time on this program, so I'm going to go ahead and, and leave her on the back burner when I talk about my mom and my sister. My mom is a huge reason for me being in the position that I'm in. She was always very encouraging to me as a kid. I was very shy, and I did not grow into this voice until like my 20s. So once it got really loud and I was kind of embarrassed by it, my mom always kind of fed into it. Like, oh, your voice is great. Uh, people love it. People can hear you from across the room. And that was always a very positive thing. I don't know if that's the case in most of the fancy restaurants that I end up in, but I don't care. I paid to be there. So I, a huge tip of the cap. Thank you. And I love you to my mom, who is, uh, I hope, listening to this. And I also want to uh, give big ups to my sister, my older sister, Mackenzie. Um, she has been a rock for me as well. I will definitely say like rock of Gibraltar type, like the prudential rock from the commercials. She keeps me grounded. Uh, it's, it's been her advice that has gotten me, uh, to pursue some of the careers that I've gone after in this life. It's also been her advice. That's kept me from jumping ship on a couple of jobs that I didn't like to, uh, throw caution to the wind, if you will. So to the women in my life, my wife included, uh, Thank you for being there because I am just a little bit of a wild card. I'm all over the place. And without the the grounding and the encouragement and the love that they provide, I wouldn't be sitting here recording this podcast for you today. So it's really important to me to get to say that to them. And we're going to talk to some amazing women behind H&M Trucking in this episode. Uh, we will talk to Patty Rupp. Uh, from accounting, we will also get to hear from Deanna uh, from Driver Advocacy just around the corner, and we will do a profile on one of H&M's female truck drivers coming up in a little bit as well. Plus, we'll give Mr. President himself, James Fonda, the only male that will be heard from on today's show besides myself, a chance to uh, gas up those ladies as well. Uh, real quick, before we move on and talk to Deanna from Driver Advocacy, I hooked up with Tim from JFL Logistics to bring you your uh, freight market update. And this week's is coming once again from DAT Freight and Analytics. It's not the most positive outlook, but uh, hang with me through some of the stats and we'll get you to a quote from Ken Adamo, who is DAT's chief of analytics that has a little bit of a bright spot to it. I do want to talk about the spot market because I know that's a, it's a big deal right now out there. And uh, the spot van rate averaged $2.06 a mile, which is down $0.10 cents compared to March and $0.71 cents lower than this time last year. Uh, the spot reefer rate fell $0.09 cents to $2.41 a mile. That's $0.72 cents lower than last year at this time. And the spot flatbed rate dipped $0.04 cents to $2.67 a mile down 70 cents year over year. What Ken has to say here is, quote, May will be pivotal for shippers, brokers, and carriers. After a challenging first four months of the year, we expect the effects of seasonality on freight volumes and rates. Uh, the question is how sustainable these effects will be. 
We've got our fingers crossed that they're going to be very sustainable, uh, but I'm no expert. I'm just reading this stuff off of a page and bringing you the info. The national average load to truck ratios decreased, indicating a weaker demand for truck load capacity on the spot market. The last time van and reefer ratios was were this low uh, was May and April 2020. And you might remember that was during the supply chain shocks uh, that the pandemic cast upon the market. So there's your freight market update for this week. We'll keep bringing them to you. I'm going to keep getting with Tim and sooner or later, we'll have Tim back on the program to discuss this a little bit more in depth. Uh, but right now I want to get to one of my favorite segments on the show. And that's when we talk to Deanna from driver advocacy. <music> It's that time of the week again where we get to check in with one of my favorite people involved with this podcast. It's Deanna from Driver Advocacy. Thank you for joining us today, miss. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, uh, I look forward to this segment of the podcast every single week just because it's kind of a, a departure. Like when I talk to you, you know, when we're off the air, I tell you, like, we don't have to stay right on topic. We can kind of fish around and talk about some cool stuff. So uh, for me, this is like a little bit of my escape during my actual work day. So I, I love this segment. Hey, I'm all about that. I mean, kind of doing a little bit of work, a little bit of fun. I think if you don't do that, then you just have a miserable life. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I agree tenfold, hundred percent. So uh, we are talking just a little bit um, today about the women behind H and M Trucking. And um, in the intro, I definitely gassed up my mom and my sister uh, because they are two women in my life that just mean the absolute world to me. Uh, do you have any siblings, Deanna? Are you an only child? How's how's the family structure shake out? Uh, no, thank God I'm not an only child. Um, yeah, I have a younger sister and then I have a wonderful mom. Um, she's amazing. She's been my rock um, through a lot of hard times and I, I definitely attribute any success I have to her because she is a powerhouse woman. Like she had three jobs when I was a kid and she'd always oh, wow. come home and mow the lawn. And I was like, what kind of Red Bull? I don't even think Red Bull existed back then, but like what nope. kind of Red Bull are you on? It was just extra scoops of coffee crystals. That's all it was. You just keep adding them to the pot. Right. Just coffee <laughs> crystals and Jesus. I don't know how, <laughs> how she did it, but. Looking back, even as a kid, I'm like, man, the energy you'd have to do to do all that is just insane. Yeah, but, the energy just to be a parent. I mean, I don't have any kids. Huh. I, I see a lot of people that I you know, work with and work around that do have kids, and I don't know how on earth most moms juggle it. To be honest with you, it's just it, – it's. I didn't form that part of my brain because I'm not a parent. So like when stuff happens around me, like when my nephews have like a spaz attack and they're seven and nine, like eight and 10, like they're in that age group right now where they're growing up and they're starting to be a lot more adult like, but every now and then they'll still just fly off the handle. And I watch my sister handle it with like grace and calmness and like the ability to teach a lesson, not just yell. I don't have that. I don't, I would not be with this version of me that, that ended up at 38 years old would not be a good dad. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I think, um, I think that's a responsible, you know, thing. I mean, it's not for everybody. I mean, I don't have kids yet either. And I'm, you know, late in the game. Hey, I, I really enjoy my sleep and I enjoy my selfish time. <laughs> so I a hundred percent get that. I, well, I think you'd be a good mom just because you're so good at talking to people, listening to their uh, listening to problems, listening to whatever they want to talk about. Because, you know, there's that there's that time from like two to five where the kids are just talking nonsense anyway. And you just got to sit there and listen to them and, you know, make your own sense of it, but really just let their mind work. So I think you'd be good at it, Deanna. But, um, you know, I'm not saying go out and have kids, obviously, <laughs> each and each to their own, you know, so. Soon enough. Um, Soon enough. Yeah, exactly. So listen, I told you last week that I was going to make you a button because we're kind of working your tip of the week into this. And surprise, surprise, I actually did what I was going to what I said I was going to do. So let's introduce this new segment. Well, it's not really new. We've been doing it for a few weeks now, but let's introduce it with some damn style, huh? Yeah. 
And now Deanna's quick stop tip of the week on the H&M Trucking Podcast. I love it. That's yeah. awesome. Quick stop. I worked in quick stop there because you used to do some quick stop work. You were, you yes. know, you, you, and then I tried to find a super B. That wasn't it. That was more of like a NASCAR <laughs> stock car sounder there. But uh, it just all of it, it kind of a tip of the cap to you and all of your different areas of expertise. Uh, what do you have for us for your tip of the week this week? Yeah. So, um, I was talking to a couple of drivers and um, kind of ping-ponging some ideas. And something that came up that, you know, is super simple, but not many people think about is budgeting. Just kind of, you know, whether it be taking your paycheck and just kind of figuring out goals. So typically what I I found on the internet was doing some research is to make short-term and long-term goals for saving goals, whether it be like short-term, you know, food, groceries, some of the same same things you have over the monthly, and then long-term goals like going back to school or, you know, paying off all your debt to kind of have like a track where you can, you know, do monthly budgets and kind of keep it on track. Mm -hmm. Um, So there are a couple of apps that I found were really kind of cool with budgeting. So you can do all from your phone or from your laptop. Okay. Um, One was NerdWallet, sounds really silly. But um, yeah, so it's an app. Um, you can kind of put your information in there. Um, they also, cool thing, they will also track your credit score. Um, oh, so that's, that's nice. good always to know kind of what your credit's, what your credit's at and what to improve on. Um, credit Karma is one I use quite frequently. It'll actually pull all of your accounts from your bank. So it'll tell you like what student loans you have, what kind of debt you're in, whether credit card debt. Um, that's really cool because if you want to go through and see where you're at, you can kind of start snowballing some of those accounts. And then something I learned when doing research was called the 50-20-30 rule. So 50% of your income should go to like needs. So you need like socks or, you know, you need food. Mm-hmm. So 50% of your income should go to that. 30% should go to your wants. That's like junk you don't really need, but you want it like shoes and purses and stuff like that. Sweet um, H&M hats. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then 20% should go into savings. So 20% either that or investing, if mm-hmm. you're savvy like that. And then, you know, you could also put that 20% into paying off debt. So mm-hmm. say so you got a big credit card bill, you got some things that are tying up some interest or something. Um, yeah. But those are just a couple of tips that you can just use to just kind of like take your paycheck and kind of break it down a little bit. Um, so it becomes more manageable. Yeah, absolutely. And and listen, drivers, we've all been into some of these big truck stops. Like I know that I spend, when I go to a regular gas station, I'm in and out five, 10 minutes. When I'm at a truck stop, I find myself kind of shopping a little bit and not that I'll buy stuff because I don't have something to put a lot of these cool accessories that truck stops uh, stock on. I mean, I could put them on my pickup truck, but it's not going to be worth the money. But I've had some truckers in the past tell me like, hey, you know, they've got some pretty cool stuff in there. Like I'll go in there and, and buy some things. It, one of the things that you should think of, is that a want or a need? Because look, a, an air horn that will blow somebody's eardrums is really cool, but you might not necessarily need it unless it's a safety thing. And then maybe you need it. I think the point here is think about this stuff, uh, break it down a little bit more, be a little bit more uh, front of mind awareness about it. And you'll be able to manage your budget really easily. Uh, we had a great episode or a great guest on an episode Back when we were doing Unplugged OTR, it was episode 14, and we talked to a gentleman named Chris Lee, who is the author of The Financial Planner for Truckers, and I highly recommend you go back and listen to that. We did 30-plus minutes with Chris. He shares all sorts uh, of financial tips, and it's all geared towards professional drivers because that's what he is. So uh, your tip of the week fits right in with some content that we've already produced for this show and it's very informative. So I highly recommend going back and taking a look uh, at that. And uh, that just gives us one more reason, Deanna, to press this. And now Deanna's quick stop tip of the week on the H&M Trucking Podcast. It's beautiful. You want me to send it to you so you can have it as a ringtone? 
<laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I don't know. You might. It's like it's a little long for a ringtone. It's it's eleven <laughs> seconds, so it might annoy you after a while. But hey, uh, no, just, everybody deserves to going. have their own. Yeah, everybody deserves to have their own walk up music. I'll like, just steal my husband's phone and just call myself. Just so I can hear it over over I'll again. tell you what. Steal your husband's phone and put that in as every notification sound for every push notification, <laughs> oh, everything that he gets. I mean. <laughs> He deserves it, right? He deserves to hear that you're you're coming into the room or you're coming into his head with a, you know, with, with a cell phone notification. So, well, Deanna, once again, as always, we really appreciate your time here with us. Um, I can't tell you how much it means that you cut out some time out of the important stuff that you're doing for our drivers out there to uh, sit down and chat with us. Hit your hours one more time. Let them know where they can find you. Absolutely. I'm Eastern Time, ten to six p.m. and then I work three hours on Sunday, three to six p.m. That's Deanna, your driver advocate, and uh, she's awesome. So give her a call. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, guys. Joining us now on the H&M Trucking Podcast is driver Lori Chilton. Lori, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Of course. Now, where are you joining us from today? Right now, I'm in Nashville, headed to St. Joe's, Missouri. All right. Well, uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Um, I like to just find out a little bit about the drivers that I get to talk to here on the podcast. Uh, so why don't you tell me, how long have you been a driver for? Uh, 17 years this month. Oh, congratulations. So you're coming up on an anniversary. That's awesome. 17 years is a long time, Lori. I, it really is. <laughs> Have you been driving for H and M this whole time, or have you worked for some different companies in the past? Oh no, I've I've worked for a bunch of different types of trucking and H and M. I've worked for them uh, coming up, I think two and a half years. Uh, January will be three. Okay, that's awesome. Well, that's still a. I mean, seventeen years of experience in anything is is just a grip of experience. So I'm sure you're really good at your job at this point in time. Can you tell me? how you got into driving as a career? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're talking to someone that was going for a four-year nursing degree at Mayo Clinic. Oh, wow. And ended up, yes, and ended up uh, some family issues in the middle of college and thinking to come home and we'll finish, you know, the nursing in the near future. And then life went on and three little boys and that never happened. And... I ended up being a single mom for years and was delivering pizza from Domino's and rolling newspapers at night. And I had a chronically ill son. And at the end of the day, I took some pizzas to some drivers in a hotel and, and they're like, why don't you drive a truck? And I couldn't even imagine. I've never even been near a truck. And in fact, my family, I come from pilots. They're all pilots. And, um, I, <laughs> But looking at them, and they're like, hey, get driving, forget school, because, you know, school, what do you do with anatomy and physiology if you don't have a degree? And um, I thought, let's try it. And it was just amazing. Sure enough, within 90 days, I was making what the average attorney makes in America. So it was just unbelievable. In fact, I had my little boy with me. The other two were about grown. I'll never forget the first time we pumped fuel in the truck, and he's mortified that we're going to have to pay for all this fuel <laughs> because we can't even grasp the truck, you know, can hold up to 300 gallons, and, you know, how is this going to work? And I even carried my little Domino shirt with me in the truck for the first year just in case something happened, I could deliver pizzas. I just couldn't imagine, <laughs> you know, and, and I absolutely loved it. And, um, I had to go for training and went to the Department of Labor of all things because I had a learning disability. And they, I mean, they literally bought the tires on my car to get me to school. They said I'd be a really good researcher or a truck driver. <laughs> and, you know, it's like an astronaut or, you know, work at a steel mill. It's just bizarre. But sure enough, I, I had people say, oh, you'll be tired of it. And I, I every day, America is so beautiful. And it's so beautiful. I love it. I really do. And I understand you like to spend uh, as much of your time as you can driving out here uh, in my neck of the woods in the Pacific Northwest and on the west oh, side of the country. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And, and the stupid things you do when I 
first started driving, I first time I went to Texas, I thought, well, I'll just jog on over to California. And <laughs> it's, yeah, that's like turning around and going back to the East Coast. And then when I went up, uh, I, they took me all the way up and around the United States. And oh my goodness, Oregon was so beautiful. And all of it is just any. My dad, like I said, was a pilot, and he used to fly internationally. And he used to say, anything you want to see you'll find it maybe on a small scale but it's here in america and because he went everywhere and I, I i believe that's true that's awesome well i i feel fortunate i'm a lifelong oregon resident and i feel like i, I kind of live oh, in yeah. one of the best kept secrets uh, of the country although that it's, is, yes. it's, it's not as much of a yeah. secret anymore but uh we still try to keep quiet about it you know oh it's <laughs> so beautiful it is I, I look forward to when we pick apples up in that neck of the woods each year because it's so pretty so pretty yes it really is so tell me a little bit about you said uh you've, you've got three boys um tell me a little bit about your family back home and and i know it, if they were almost fully grown when you started you probably don't have any of them in the house anymore but tell me about That's your boys it. they're scattered abroad i i have uh two in montana and one still in georgia and i'm a grandmother you know, I get told a lot. Well, in fact, they tell me I don't look like a truck driver, and I say thank you <laughs> <laughs> because the stereotype of that. And um, yeah, there. I that's why I stay out. I've never never drove locally. I've always I ended up once the last one grew up. You know, I stay out here and then I go visit. You know, it's always good to see them and then move on to the next. So yeah. That's awesome. And, and and what a cool thing that you've got a job that takes you just as you work to where you can visit your family. Um, I've always thought that is one of the coolest parts about being a professional driver. When you decided that you wanted to become a driver, what did your family think of the decision? You said your your youngest boy was a little blown away by the fuel. Uh, did your, your parents or, or any brothers and sisters that you might have, were they all pretty supportive of the decision as well? Well, by that point, they were, you know, anything but working yourself to death with newspapers. And I mean, I, I literally worked every single day of the year to keep us afloat. And um, by that point, you know, because I had mentioned it initially, they thought, have you lost your mind? You know, because again, they were kind of white collar and blue collar. And then as I began in it, um, within probably a year or two, they, they all have always wanted to come out and see what it's like, you know, in this world. And yeah, it's, it's, everybody's been very supportive. And, uh, well, they saw it literally took, took me from nothing to everything I need to the truck, you know, I mean, talking about minimalist, that's exactly, <laughs> you know, it, it really is. So Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, I love a I love a good story of a, of a turnaround like that. Nobody should be working oh, yeah. as hard as what you were uh, just to make ends meet, you know. And it's not to oh, say that yeah. you don't work hard now, but uh, rolling newspapers and delivering pizza is a whole different oh, ball yeah. game. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't work hard now. I'm just gonna say it. It's a, it's a breeze. <laughs> it's I, I I'm telling you, everybody I need, especially because I'm middle aged. So I'm like. Get in a truck, forget driving RVs, get in a truck, get paid to see America. It's, it's just wonderful. That's awesome. So. Well, yeah. now we're talking about on this episode, I'm kind of trying to highlight the women of H&M Trucking. And that's uh, one of the, the reasons that Brenda suggested you as a as an interview subject today. And I'm so glad that she did uh, learning about your story and everything. Well, thank um, you. Oh, of course. Thank you for being here. How does being a professional driver make you feel? Well, you know, it's funny because that evolves through the years initially. You know, all I'm thinking is I just need to make some money to send home. And I would hear the differences, you know, the guys, because I didn't ever was on the CB. You know, he drives the Pete and he drives the Kenworth. And I'm thinking, I don't care what I drive. I'm not wearing it. What does it matter? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just comfortable. And, and now as, as the years go on, you get where you respect that. You see, you know, like you know how certain drivers are going to be certain companies you can name it you'll, i mean you just you learn stuff and yeah it, it has its own own classes and its own uh, people but initially it was very hard as far as being accepted because uh, i went in uh 
very quickly, I was doing end dumping and hauling into Canada as there is waste in this big end dump truck. Well, you know, that's, that's a rough, that's a rough bunch. <laughs> but, but respect to them, because they're the ones, you know, when the ice is on the road, they're coming out. And just, I, I began to learn so much about so much, much of it. And, and there was definitely prejudice. I mean, there's no way around it. I, have been told a thousand times, why are you out here? Why don't you go home and make cookies? I, I tell you, many things that were said over the CB. And just, and I was never a feminist, but I started seeing a lot of, it was a man's world, that's for sure. But the full circle of that, by the time it was over, I thought, you know what? And some of those men, I couldn't have made it had they not helped me. Yeah. And gave me some incredible advice. And, you know, you, you if some of these, the women that I've met come out, they're going to be tough girl and men don't know what to do. Are we supposed to help her? Or is she going to get offended? I've, I've seen that. And I'm like, you want to help me anytime? Feel free. <laughs> and, um, it worked out. I found my place and I, and I remember I ran with a bunch, uh, back then you ran a lot across, you know, in, in groups. And I, I finally made the grade when I went through three of the big passes in Colorado and some of them got on the CB and said, hey, you know what? You're a pretty good driver. And that meant so much to me because by that point, I had respect for them, you know? Right. So, yeah, it's, it's been a – there's a little bit of everything out here, that's for sure. I've, I've got some stories here for to believe, especially as a woman. There initially was a whole lot before there were cameras that, you know, uh, drivers, not uh, truck drivers, but four-wheelers would pull up and do – things that were unheard of and you couldn't do anything but just stare straight ahead because they're <laughs> at your window and uh but a lot of that has stopped i've seen trucking i think has cleaned up a whole lot from when you know they, they used to have a lot of stuff at the truck stops if you know what i'm saying and oh yeah i think a lot of the families now go to the trucks and, and the truck stores and yeah i, I think it's been, it's come full circle well, that's good because I, I was when I was researching this topic a little bit. What I uh, came across was that it hasn't even been that long, relatively, that you know all truck stops have had full-on female facilities for showering and stuff like that. Like that hasn't been something that has been a part of of the industry for its entire life. Did that ever affect you out there? Have you ever come across a place uh, in your seventeen years? Probably, obviously, in the past, quite a bit, but in a place where it was like it, it it was such a male dominated industry that they didn't even have a shower for you or something like that oh absolutely uh even now and this is it probably sounds petty but again i think no it matters because i do agriculture i'm in a hopper it, it does it brings a lot of dirty and um you go in the restroom first of all like the women's restrooms many times they're not where they're, they should be they're over in some restaurant where the driver's lines will just have for the men. And not many truck stops, but there's definitely a few left of some of the commercial ones. Uh, you go in to wash your hands, they're covered in, you know, stuff from the farms, and there's no soap that you would normally have in other truck stops for that kind of stuff. It's all in the men's bathroom because hoppers are very much a male-dominated, you know, uh, field. But at the same time, is that wrong? Or, or you know, I, I have no idea because it makes sense. Where would you put it when 97% of drivers are male? Why would you put it in the female restaurant? You know, so just little things. Um, you'll see that. Now, at one point, I had my own authority and brokered my loans. And it was so bad that I would have to get drivers to come in and get quotes on jobs. Because it was always put your husband on or, you know, hi there, gal. And, and so I would get really low quotes on jobs. And then I would have a driver call on his phone and I'd sit there and listen to him give him a completely different quote. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely a fight. But at the same time, when you, you know, when you finally earn your respect and you know the ropes, they, they got your back. They're with you. You get good brokers or you get people that they know you're going to get it done and that uh, you may have to try a little harder. But, yeah, I, it, it's been well worth it. I, I find it balances out afterwards. And, you know, the men will tell you their side. 
you know, all a woman has to do is just, you know, act her like she's in peril and everybody drops her, people favor her to the front of the line, <laughs> and they have to stay back there. So, you know, again, it's, it's, it's tick for tat. Sure. You give a little, you take a little for sure. I, I totally understand that. Now, right. it, you know, on that note, can you tell me a story of a time where you maybe had to straighten one of your male colleagues in the uh, industry out for maybe being inappropriate or maybe um, um, taking some liberties oh. or, or saying some things to you that they shouldn't have? Oh, yeah, that's that's the days of the CB <laughs> because they're not accountable. And, you know, you you stick out like a sore thumb because here's all you hear are men and then here's a woman like your last direction. And all of a sudden, oh, here it comes. You know, there's going to be a few that are going to be lewd with you or, or they're going to, you know, what are you doing out here? You know, shouldn't you be changing diapers? You know, this kind of stuff. But what, what will happen is, yes, eventually – you can narrow it down who it is and you pull up right beside him. <laughs> and of course they'll stare straight ahead, you know, <laughs> just not knowing. But yes, I've definitely had to do that. I've been at jobs where especially when I was younger and I would get out with my bill of lighting to go to the office and check in and I would turn around and drivers were being standing in a line to hand me their papers. Oh. And I'm like, what are you doing? Because I thought I was, I worked there. See, I didn't, because again, I wasn't the stereotype of a driver. And just little stuff like that we'd laugh about. But yeah, but again, it's, it's really that way with any job. You know, you've got the idiots and you've got the ones that will look out for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, you know, it's being such a male dominated industry. The thing that, that kind of sucks about it is that you had to you, you had to do more to earn that respect than what your oh, your far. typical ma typical male did. And, absolutely. And absolutely. You know, with yeah. all that experience that you have and, and the reasons that you became a driver, the purpose that you had behind your your decision probably makes you better than a, than at least half of them. I would say maybe even more than that. You're probably in the top 10 percentile because you had a, a, a thought behind why you decided to make this career change. You were, you needed to put food on the table and not have to beat yourself to death over your job. Um, motivated exactly. people like that tend to come out and be better at what they do. And so I'm sure that there's, you know what, if there's any of you male truck drivers out there listening right now, um, Next time you hear a female on the radio and you feel like saying something lewd or inappropriate, maybe just clam up, okay? Because there's there's really <laughs> no it. reason for it. Yeah, zip it. That's I mean, great advice from Lori here. So, um, <laughs> you know, can you tell me a time that maybe you felt the most appreciated by this male dominated industry? Uh, I'd have to think about that one. I think that would be more from the company. I, I love H&M. You know, it, hands down, it's the best company I've ever worked for. You know, all of them tell you, oh, we're going to be your family. When you come, we're not like other companies. And here they say the same thing. I thought, here we go. And they truly are. And if there's been anybody that has gave me an atta girl, it's been my company. I am, I mean, by far. So out here, I don't look forward. It rarely comes if. But where I've got my uh, approvals, I guess, even I've done, definitely done some very dumb things before, is the appreciation with my company. They, they, I feel like I know a couple times I've gotten the most uh, miles running, and I think they would say, Lori will get it there. Uh, I mean, I will get it there for every last minute to wherever it's got to go. I may I may lose my papers, and I'm sure a couple will be laughing or have to get extra copies or whatever. But the load will get there, and it will get there safely, God willing. So, and I I think I've established that with my company and a couple other companies I work for in the end would say that. So, that that's probably about it. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, that's a great example, and and you're not the first person to tell me what you just told me about H and M. In fact, I hear that more about H and M trucking than I ever oh, thought yeah. that I would, and not. Not to say I had any preconceived notions about H and M. It's just I, I've I, as I go through all the forums and I'm I'm reading online about you know anecdotal stories from people. It seems like kind of what you said. A lot of uh, the trucking companies out there are heavy on the lip service, but when it comes time to actually put up or shut oh, up, yeah. they might not yeah. be there. And H and M really seems to be. Oh 
oh yeah, you're just a number. You're, you're exactly right. They could care less. They don't care about if you're, you know, you're exhausted. They don't get it there. And H and M is not that way. I mean, and and you know, it's seeing how they say. We know people by their names. They really do. They really do. Yeah, so. they do. And and actually, that brings me to my last question for you. It's not really a question, but. Can you talk to me a little bit about the relationship that you've built with uh, with Brenda Hampton, who we will talk to uh, later on in the show? She told me when I was in Omaha a couple weeks ago that it's really important to her to build a really close relationship with her drivers so that uh, they know or you know that that you can trust her. Talk to me a little bit about your relationship with Brenda. Yes. Um, initially, she she did like a dedicated account, which I don't know if you know what that means, but it's she has like her own group of drivers that goes just specifically to these one companies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I had heard she's a tough girl and nothing bad, but just, you know, know your, know your row. And, um, I went to do that because I, the only reason I wanted to do it is because I thought I'd be home to Georgia more and because of other factors it didn't really work out. But, if anything could go wrong, uh, the whole time I've been with that company was when I was under her, and it wasn't her fault. <laughs> Just freaking things with my truck. I I slipped and fell. I this or that, and I know she thought, "What you know? What what happened to this driver? Because she didn't know me good." And she was so supportive. I absolutely. I, in fact, I hear that she may be you know, changing roles in the near future with H&M. And I'm excited, even though I love the one that may be retiring, but oh, uh, she, she will go to bat for you. She, at least she did me. That's all I know. She absolutely went to bat, never a harsh word. Absolutely. And, and what I loved about it, she keeps you posted. She lets you know what's coming. Are we, are we, you know, how you doing? You know, it's, it's not just throw you a line and, Hope you find your way. I mean, I, I really appreciate it, Brenda. That's awesome. Well, she speaks very highly of you as well, and uh, looking forward to getting to chat with her a little bit later on in this episode. So, uh, Lori, I've taken up enough of your time today. I know you're out there driving around. I want you to be safe out there. Keep the shiny side up, and uh, thank you so much for for joining us here today on the H and M Trucking Podcast. Well, thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate it. No problem. We'll get you back on sometime in the future. I promise you that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, take care, Lori. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. of a 14-year-old, Ryan Hoob, who was killed while riding his bike on Friday. The initial findings in the investigation say Hoob was hit by the trailer of a semi-truck as it was turning. A six-year-old boy has died after being hit by a semi-truck. Police tell us the child was standing on the corner when the back of it went onto the curb and hit the child. Looking at the mirror all the time. I, I, I know what's going on 30 seconds ago and two seconds ago. I heard sirens, but you don't think. And then I want to be turned around. My son pointed out, that's Kevin's car. Kevin Pope couldn't be saved after he was struck by a semi-truck at the busy corner of Weatherby and Landstar. He was just 10 years old. A child dies on the way to school, hit and killed by a semi-truck. You know, it might sound over dramatic. Uh, what I did right there, it might sound like just anxiety in a one minute clip. And there's a reason for that. Um, as much as I like to keep things lighthearted on this podcast and as much as I like to have fun and come out here and tell jokes and, and just be myself, uh, as I've delved more into this whole, the kids are out of school and the kids are at play thing. What I found is pretty disturbing, and as as a recurring segment on this podcast, obviously these are going to change. Uh, we're not always going to just beat the you know there's kids out there be careful thing drum over and over again, but we do see it as necessary, being that it's that time of year. Everybody's getting out of school. I mean, there were graduations. Graduations are all over Memorial Day weekend, so that's going to be two weeks in the past by the time this episode airs. Look, it's really important to to talk about this stuff and to realize that 
it, it's not just like we talked about last week where it's like, look out for him in the driveway, look out for him in parking lots. Obviously, that's a really big deal. But listen to this. Getting hit by a car is the third leading cause of death for kids five to nine years old. And kids up to age 15 make up a disproportionate number of pedestrian casualties worldwide. Now, I got that directly from the Association for Psychological uh, Science. Basically, kids are easily distracted. They're not paying attention. And it's important to remember, you as a professional driver out there listening, you drive for a living. Me, as just a normal four-wheeler, uh, I drive a lot. I mean, way more than what I would ever have thought. And the the point behind this is that we develop these instincts as drivers, whether they be a professional driver or just a, a everyday to work and home commuter, you develop these instincts and these, uh, I guess, little sixth senses that come around every now and then. Have you ever had a time where you just go, man, I, I saw that light turn green and I'm just going to take a breath here and then all of a sudden somebody flies through the intersection or you happen to check right, check left, check right again, and then you're about to go, but you go, I'm going to check to the right again, and all of a sudden there's somebody in the bike lane. These are the instincts that you develop as a driver that you don't have as a child because you're not driving. They might get those types of instincts on their BMX bike or their scooter, but they're not going to have them when it comes to vehicles. And, and to be honest, especially according to this article from the Association for Psychological Science, they're just not paying attention because they don't have that overarching instinct that cars can do a lot of damage. They're going very fast. They're going or they're running very heavy, especially in the case of a semi truck. And the, the kids just aren't tuned in to that plane of existence yet. So it's important that we remember. And I'm sorry if my little audio clip there gave you a, a bit of an anxiety attack, but to be honest, when I was putting that together, I was researching this segment, I was sort of taken aback by the amount of children that are harmed when it comes to vehicles, whether they're pedestrians or in car crashes. But listen to this, around 1,700 children under the age of 16 are killed annually in car crashes, with an additional 240,000 children injured. Further, almost 100 kids under age 4 are killed each year. An additional 2,400 are seriously injured when a vehicle backs over them in a parking lot or a driveway. That stat coming from the group Kids and Cars, which differs a little bit from the stat that I read you last week, but still is an important one to remember. So while you're out there, while you're coming into town, while you're you know pulling up to a shipper or a receiver, just have it in the back of your mind. Maybe have it in the front of your mind during the summer months. It's really important. And, and think about how you feel if you were to have a terrible accident and injure or kill a child. It's nothing that anybody wants to live with. Uh, so we figured we'd dedicate a few seconds to it on this podcast and talk about it a little bit. Be safe out there. Keep your eyes up. Be vigilant on the road. Drive defensively. Do all the things that you would normally do and add an extra sprinkle of looking out for those kids because, as we said in the last episode, Slow down, Earnhardt. There's kids at play. It's true. Now let's get to the next interview. Joining us next here on the H&M Trucking Podcast is another one of the fantastic women behind H&M Trucking. It is Patty Roop, and Patty is from the accounting department. Uh, Patty, I totally probably just butchered your job title, so thank you for joining us first and foremost. And what is your job title over there at H&M? I am the controller. The controller. So does that mean you get control of everything, or are you just kind of controlling numbers and things like that? Like, you don't have a leash around James's neck, do you? I try not to. <laughs> yeah, it's too much responsibility, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just I just reel him in every now and then. Oh, yeah. perfect. Well, somebody has to. I mean, come on, the guy's out there stepping on sea urchins all over the place. Somebody needs to watch him. And it. No. <laughs> I always say it's not my turn, but I guess I'll take a shift if I need to. 
<laughs> so, Patty, I understand uh, that you were in the military before uh, working for H&M. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience, how you got uh, into your military service and everything? Well, I'm an Air Force brat, so I grew up as a dependent after high school. Plans for college was way off, so I joined the military and ended up going to the East Coast to Paris Island and then to the West Coast to 29 Palms. And then I came off active duty and due to family responsibilities. And then I joined the Army National Guard out of Missouri. And so, and since then I transferred to the Nebraska National Guard and I was a unit clerk with a trucking company over in Iraq. And then before that, I was in mobile communications. Wow. So you've had a lot of experience. Now, were you always in the Army National Guard? Was that the only branch or were you in a, in another branch of the military? Oh, no. No. I was in the Marine Corps to start out with. Okay. Well, it and then when I decided to go back in the service, the Marine Corps recruiter didn't call me back fast enough. Oh, what a jerk. What was he thinking? You had all this distinguished service and then he just doesn't pick up the phone? <laughs> yeah, I was a uh, almost single parent at the time and the Marine Corps reserves aren't conducive to, you know, single parents. And, you know, at that time, the unit near there wasn't uh, one that uh, would have taken very many women to start out with. So, okay. I had to go to a different branch to get retrained into some other technical skill that would work. Okay. So, gotcha. Well, I would like to say from everyone here at the H and M Trucking Podcast, I know I speak for everyone. Uh, fresh off of of a Memorial Day weekend and saying thank you yeah. for your service. Uh, we really do appreciate that over here. We get to talk to a lot of vets on this podcast, and it's important yeah. that we always thank them. So it's much appreciated what you've done for our country. Uh, thank you. How did that experience kind of translate into what you're doing at H&M? I heard you say when you were over in Iraq, you were working kind of with a trucking company. Um, did any of that experience translate to H&M? It did in the way that um, how we, um, I came, my, my civilian job before I came to H&M Trucking was in a public accounting firm. So, you know, I didn't deal with people, or I did, but just their taxes. But coming over to H&M, Having dealt with or handled um, understanding of logistics, getting the product from point A to point B, how we're getting it there, um, and all the the people behind the scenes in operating that. Because, yeah, I was with a, a trucking company in Kuwait City that ran convoys up into Iraq every day, you know, seven days a week. And, you know, that was in 2003, 2004. So or 2004, 2005. So it was kind of a little hot and heavy at that time, but it was um, quite an experience. But you, you, I was dealing with the people behind the scenes. So that really helped with understanding the culture here at H&M and the drivers and how we interact with the drivers. Oh, for sure. And I, I can bet that being effectively a war zone at the time, if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, a whole different kind of pressure than what the drivers that are out here on America's highways deal with. Um, I imagine they probably came back pretty rattled a time or two. Yes, they did come back pretty rattled. And yeah, we had some, some conflicts that sent a couple people home, but everybody went home. So that's and great. kicking and screaming, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you were over there, were you, it's, I always, have trouble asking this question because I've talked to a lot of vets that really the word enjoyed their service doesn't really, it doesn't really compute for me, but did you, did you get a lot from it when you were over there? Did you come back a, a better person in any facet? Did you, or did you enjoy actually being over there when you were? <laughs> There's enjoy and enjoyment. Okay. 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 There is, um, it was quite, cultural enlightening as to what was going on over there and how people live because you know you drive through one of the main cities in Iraq and it's desolate and you know the size of you know a small town in Nebraska but that's a big city you know mm -hmm. it's you know the countryside is not Nebraska <laughs> you know it's 
<laughs> sand desert, you know, but I had, like I said, previously spent time in um, 29 Palms, California, which is also a desert area. So just the way of life over there and how things are done and then being an outsider coming into there. Then we were secluded on our bases and everything, but you, you make it work and you make it work for you and the people that you're got with you because um, it, you want everybody to go home safely and you want everybody you leave behind to have the safe environment that they have. But yeah, the enjoy, I missed my family. I mean, it's, it's, you know, did the time over there, you know, there was some highlights, there was some high points, you know, we, we made it work. Mm -hmm. So So it kind of sounds like your, your perspective on what you, what you had back here at home uh, might've shifted a little bit to really appreciate it uh, more than than maybe you did when you left um, just to see how, other people live in, in countries like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's a little different. I mean, you know, and I came home and my oldest son joined the Marine Corps right after I came home or while I was gone. And then he got stationed back over in Iraq a year and a half later. Wow. And he's over there complaining. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, you're, and you're the wrong number to call when he's going to complain from there, yeah. right? <laughs> Exactly. I'm like, um, dear, I know where you're at. <laughs> I know the, I know the facilities that you have. <laughs> don't, don't, don't complain. It could be worse. So, yeah. So you know, that, that was got, one of the things. Yeah. You've got three generations now of your family that, uh, that are, are military service members. That's pretty amazing. You said you grew up an air force brat. So I assume, was it your dad or your mom that yep. was in the air force? My, my dad was a career air force sergeant. I grew up, I, that's, that's what brought me to Omaha was my dad got stationed here at Offutt when I was in high school. And, uh, you know, I left and came back, but my dad actually was a Marine in Vietnam. So the Marine Corps is one of the things that my, my older brother was a Marine and, or is a Marine and my son is a Marine. So it's kind of, and my husband is army national guard and our middle son was in the army. So yeah, we've got a pretty good military family base here and my daughter swears she'll never join. So (laughs) I always wonder if there's one family member that, that is, has that sentiment, you know, where they've watched the entire family before them for generations join. And then all of a sudden there's one that just say, I'm not going to do it the same way everybody else did. And there's yeah. something to be said for that. You learn a little bit from all of your family's experiences and, uh, you know, maybe it's just not for her. Is she, does she have a different career in mind? Something that she's, uh, going after at this point? Oh yeah. She just graduated with her master's degree in accounting. So, so she got a little bit of Patty in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she does. Yes, she does. Very cool. Well, uh, can you just talk to me a little bit about the culture at H and M? You mentioned it earlier, and how uh, being over in Iraq kind of helped you assimilate and helped you understand the culture. Uh, but there's one thing, and I've said it before on this podcast. It, it, when I got to go actually to Omaha a few weeks back and actually spend some time there, I was talking to James at one point in time, and I just said, "Man, I'm astounded at the culture that you've created here. It's it's very mm-hmm. evident when you walk in the doors that everybody likes their job, everybody's happy to be there, and everybody has a common goal in mind. Can you speak to that and your involvement in that culture and, and how coming to work makes you feel each day? Yeah. When I um, first started here 16 years ago, the reason was because it was a family-owned business, small enough so that we knew everybody's name. The driver's we knew them all, you know, we have grown over the past 16 years, but we still try to keep that. I may not know all the drivers names, but I'm going to greet them as if I know who they are when they walk in the door. We try to be family friendly, but we are still trying to run a business, you know? So, you know, you can only go so, you know, I'll do whatever I can to keep my children from stumbling, but you know, with the family and everything, we have to put the line there to make sure that uh, we have to remind them that 
we care about them, but we're not here to be their mom and dad right. or their sister brother, but we are here for them when they need it. And we're the, you know, when they have an issue, um, if they have a problem, unless we know about it, we can't help you. So, you know, if a driver has an issue at home or is dealing with a problem, you know, if they call in and talk and tell us what's going on, we'll try to help them to make sure that they can achieve what their goal is, whether it's, hey, I need to get home to take care of my family. Okay, great. What can we do to help you? You know, but we don't want to leave a customer in the lurch either. But if we don't know about those things, we can't help you. Sure. But if we know, know things, and same thing with our staff. It's like, you know, if there's a family issue going on, I mean, two weeks ago, I had three people out in the accounting HR department because of graduation. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. three, three high schoolers right in this, you know, six, six quad area. And it's like, okay. We're, we're just going to tough it out and hopefully, you know, nothing blows up, but, um, we will work through any problems and we'll help you to achieve your goals. Now, if one of your goals is to be a billionaire, I'm sorry, it's not going to work here. <laughs> well, we can give you some investing tips if you're pulling through Las Vegas on how to turn a quick profit, but it's not always guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. and the store next door sells Powerball. There go you go. For it. There you go. <laughs> you know? That's a, you know, that's a $2 chunk of your retirement that you donate each week, but yes. it's shown to be worth yeah. it. Uh, in anecdotal, yeah, yeah. in anecdotal examples. But I, I think it's so yeah. cool, Patty, because you, you said it, you know, we treat everybody when they walk through the door, I'm going to, you're going to say hi to them. Like, you know, them. and I was a person that literally no one knew. And I walked in and people started yeah. saying hi to me and greeting me. And it wasn't until I spoke up and a couple people recognized my voice that they even <laughs> put two and two together as to who I was. But I, I mean, I, I could have, picked out a cubicle and sat down and started getting some work done. And I think you guys just would have accepted that I was a new part of the team. So, uh, right. It, right. If, if you could have found a cubicle, cause they're all full now. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, this is Patty. You're, you're a great person to have on here. I got to thank Eve for recommending you. Uh, this has been an awesome little interview and just learning a little bit more about your experience and the culture there at H and M is exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, with this podcast mm -hmm. where we are honoring the women of H&M. Uh, you are one of them. Thank you again for your service uh, to the country and also for your service to H&M over the past 16 years. We really appreciate your time, and thank you for being here on the H&M Trucking Podcast today. Well, well, thank you, Marcus. I have enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, we'll talk to you again for sure. All right, great. We're going to welcome on another one of the amazing women from H&M Trucking right now. Please welcome Hopper Division Manager and vet of this show. She's been on plenty of times, and we're going to have her on a lot more. Brenda Hampton. Brenda, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Marcus. I actually have to give you uh, all the credit for this episode because when I was in Omaha, this was one of the episodes that you were the first person to sit down with us. You helped us out with so many good ideas for episodes, and this was kind of one of them that came out of our meeting was to, uh, you know, find a way to uh, shed some light on, bring some attention to and say thank you to the women uh, behind H&M Trucking. You, of course, are one of them, a manager in the Hopper division. Um, when we were talking about that, like, can you share with me some of the reasons that you thought that we should do this episode? Because it was I, I was really taken by the fact that I hadn't come up with this idea yet and when you gave it to me I was like that's such a great that might be the best episode idea that I came out of Omaha with so um you know do you want to just talk a little bit about the women that work there at H&M and and our drivers or office staff or uh, any of them and just kind of uh you know pat them on the back a little bit here yeah no absolutely you know to start out we got a great group of girls that pull through on our recruiting department they kind of have a really hard job you know sniffing through drivers and this and that. So those three women over there, they are hard workers, great workers, and they bring us in great people for truckers here in H&M. And then, uh, you know, we've got, we've got an accounting, we've got a bunch of girls in accounting that are just, have been here for years and have been, worked wonderful with everyone. Um, and I also want to conclude some of those girl drivers, the women drivers out there, you know, they work hard, 
do the same business as the men and everything. But I'm definitely going to pat the recruiting girls on the back a little bit more than the rest of them because they really do have a hard job. Yeah, they really do. And and they do a great job of it. I mean, I haven't gotten to talk to every single driver that uh, works for H&M. Of course, I'm working on it. I'll get there sooner or later. But at this point, <laughs> uh, I've only, you know, spoken to a handful. And what I find is you, you seem to really get some good people in there working for the company and driving your trucks. And uh, that's that's the recruitment team right there uh, doing their job. And they were, of course, very welcoming to me when I was in Omaha as well. So thank you. Uh, because as, Absolutely. as I told Patty Roop when we had her on, uh, it's a little weird to have this dude just walk in and nobody knows who he is. Nobody's ever seen him before. <laughs> um, but you guys treated me like I was family. I mean, I, I told Patty, I could sit down here and start work and you guys have probably just signed me a paycheck every couple of weeks. So, uh, I, I really felt that and the culture there at H and M is just outstanding. Uh, another thing that you and I talked about a little bit was, when I want to turn the focus to our our, our women drivers for H and M and talk a little bit about um, you brought up you said I, I want to talk about how we can help keep women safe on the road um, because it's it's a big world out there obviously every driver that is a, a, a professional knows that and there's a lot of things that can go wrong but in such a male dominated industry sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that. Maybe there are some extra precautions or some extra things that we should talk about when it comes to keeping women safe on the road. Uh, can you talk to me about that just a little bit and tell me your thoughts on on how women can stay safe on the road, how to be vigilant out there, and how you help them from the home office? Yes, yeah. So, you know, basically staying safe out there, we're relying a lot on the other, the other truckers out there, you know. Um, I'm going to say there's a, a big group of great men out there that do actually look out for the women. Um, you know, if it's just going to the truck stop, if it's parking at night, any of that, I have found a bunch of men that have just, uh, what do you say, created a bond maybe with some of our female drivers. And it's great. That is probably one of my big advocates is having the, the men step up. They do a great job out there. They're always willing to help, which is great, uh, you know, for the female, keeping them safe. I would say being aware They've just got to be aware of their surroundings a little bit more than, than the, you know, regular truck driver. You know, I would do have to say, I'm going to give it to the, the male men that actually watch out and I give them props for helping out the, the females out there. A lot of them seem like they would make really good big brothers. You know, that's, that's the kind of yes. the feeling that I get from them when I, when I hear them talk and everything. And, and it's like, man, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a big brother, but I kind of wanted one. <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I get some of that from some of these guys as well. And it's really cool because, you know, it, it's such a different environment. When you think about your work environment, you know, you see the same people at the office every single day, or, or maybe not every day, but most days, uh, our drivers out there, they're not seeing the same people. They might get to talk to them, but they're not in the same vicinity maybe not even in the same state as a lot of the other drivers. So if they can form that bond and really help out when they're out there, uh, that's, that's just amazing. And I think it speaks more to the quality of the culture there at H&M Trucking. Absolutely. I call my, my drivers on my, that I manage, you know, I call them my brothers. They're big brothers. That's what they are. Um, they're family. Um, so it means a lot for me because they do look out for me in this industry. And, and it's great to see. Absolutely. Now, you talked a little bit when I was back there in Omaha, and, and I keep referencing that because Brenda and I had an awesome meeting, just so everybody knows. She was yeah, the first great. one to come in and sit down with us, and we talked from the point that the meeting started until it ended, and there was so much good information that came out of it. One of the things that you touched on is that you really like to build a close relationship with your drivers so that they know that anytime, anywhere, anything goes wrong, they can trust you, Brenda. Um, does that change at all from the male drivers to the female drivers? Do you have to uh, kind of approach those situations differently? Or can you kind of go right down the middle and, and treat everybody uh, the exact same when it comes to building that relationship? You know, I'm going to be honest. The women are more set on their own. Um, so the relationship I have with them is more of like a, maybe a mother-daughter. Mm -hmm. Um 
with the men, it's more of a brother sister kind of thing. Um, I don't know why it's always been that way. That's, it's just kind of set out that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because the men treat me more like that, you know, little sister. I'm going to punch in the shoulder (laughs) kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah, but you'll hit Um, them back, Brenda. I I can tell you'll hit back. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and the one thing would, that I like, um, about my job is women, men, they may, may be different when you're talking to them and everything, but really in this industry, in the end, they all get the same job done. And I love it. Yeah. The, the men are, uh, like I said, they're my big brothers. Um, <laughs> and the women, they do have a tendency to, to run their own, uh, their own show. Well, that's good. I mean, what's, you know, I would imagine, and, and listen, if this is totally short-sighted and, and just, um, uh, naive of me to say, then we'll have Mike cut the whole thing out. But, I imagine that when you pull up to a pump, and I'm going to ask Lori Chilton about this later on in the podcast. We're going to have Lori on. That was another thing I got to thank Brenda for. Uh, She told me about Lori as a driver for H&M and said it would be a great interview, and I'm really looking forward to it. But I'm going to ask her, like, is there a sense of pride that comes out of, you know, pulling up to the pump in, in your beautiful truck, fully loaded? You've just made a really, really complicated driving maneuver to get where you need to be, and you step out. And all the guys staring at the uh, truck to see a female step out of it. That doesn't happen all the time. So there's got to be a sense of pride that comes with that. That's like, yeah, that's right. I'm absolutely well, as good, if not better than you at what you do. I 100% believe you on that. Uh, simply because, you know, being in this uh, industry, you know, for the last 20 years, I may not be feeling or seeing the, the different response that other people are going through. But as a driver aspect, that might be a lot different. They might get something different. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'll find out. And I'm going to ask Lori. And she seems like such a sweetheart. When I talked to her on the phone earlier, I I was so excited to get her on here. Because, first of all, we haven't had a female driver on the show for a long time. In fact, since we were doing Unplugged OTR and so it's it's high time. It's it's more than high time. We're overdue at this point. Yes, and Lori Chilton, uh, it don't matter, male, female, what you are. She'll outwork you. I'm just telling you, that girl is a solidness. Um, <laughs> and I'll be interesting. I'm going to listen to that podcast for sure because I'm interested to see how that one goes. That, that That's just such a great idea. Appreciate all the support you've given us. Oh, well, hey, I appreciate the support you've given me. And I get this little, this, this inclining in the back of my mind that you too, it doesn't matter, male, female, or indifferent, you will outwork somebody. And I, I don't know. I got this, I got this uh, feeling from you when I was there in the office that if you do decide <laughs> to hit one of your brothers back, you're going to hit a little harder than what they hit you too. Is that true? <laughs> Absolutely. Very <laughs> competitiveness in me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Brenda, I, I've taken up enough of your time today. I just want to say thanks again. You thanked me for the support I've given you. I'm turning that right back around. You have been an absolute uh, a great addition for this podcast in not only your interviews, which are always awesome, but behind the scenes, you've helped me out a lot. So uh, big ups to Hopper Division Manager Brenda Hampton. Thank you so much for coming and spending a little bit of time with us today. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you for getting out there and doing this for the drivers. Oh, of course. Of course. I hope to get to meet as many of them as I can. And if you're a driver listening to this right now and you go, hey, why haven't I been on the podcast? Get in touch with Brenda. Brenda's your conduit to me. If you're on her team and you want to be on this podcast, give her a call or give your division manager a call. Let them know you want to be on here. We'll work it out. Yes. Yep. I will help them out. Awesome. Thanks, Brenda. Have a great day. You too, Marcus. Mm, Bye-bye. It's that time of the week again where we get president of H&M Trucking, James Fonda, on the horn and talk to him a little bit about what we're talking about today. James, thanks for joining us once again. Hey. So we're talking about the women behind H&M Trucking, and I've had the privilege to speak to uh, quite a few of them over the course of this podcast. But this week, uh, we got Brenda in here. Uh, We talked to driver Lori Chilton. And uh, we also talked to Patty Roop there. Uh, you got a pretty amazing cast of uh, females there working for you at H&M. How do they add to this amazing culture that we see uh, every day in the office there and on the road? Uh, Well, they certainly know how to keep it lively. I'll give them that. (laughs) Uh, Whether that's good or bad is yet to be determined. You know, uh, we we are lucky to have a good group uh, of of everybody. Uh, 
Patty's been great. She's been with us for a long time, as you as you know. And uh, uh, you know, we've got Eve. Uh, you know, we've got a ton of people. A ton of women at the top. You know, get, once you break it down, you got Brenda, you got Lindsay, you got uh, Cindy, Lisa. Um, I mean, even all the way down to like Jane, the shop. And you, you really got some some impressive uh, people that are that are kind of keeping this place together uh, for all those men to screw it up. <laughs> Oh, man, I feel that one deep in my heart, James. I really do. (laughs) Um, You know, one that I met when I was there in Omaha who uh, I think could give me and everyone else with a uh, with a fast talking mouth a run for their money is Brittany. Um, She she set me straight, man. And you know what? Any confidence that I had that was above the level that I should have. Brittany's good at knocking you down and keeping you honest every day, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. I am surrounded. I call it the, the, the hornet's nest a little bit. Uh, <laughs> just surrounded by the women of my life. Uh, so <laughs> it keeps you, it definitely keeps you humble. Yeah. I'll we'll, we'll say that, you know, when, when you're having a, when you're having a weird day, they'll definitely make sure that, it, you know, knock you off that horse. Yes. Real quick. They will. Uh, I, uh, you know, yeah. when we, you took us out to, uh, to the country club there in Omaha to uh, have dinner and I was worried uh, that day you know, I'm, I'm a hat guy. I've got a hat on my head 365 days a year if I can hack it. And uh, I asked everybody at the table. One of them happened to be Brittany. Eve was there as well. And I said, can I wear my hat to the country club? I know it's kind of golfy, but I also know that those places can be, uh, you know, a little bit more upscale as far as the way the dress code works. And Brittany says, take off your hat. And I took off my hat and she goes, no, no, Jesus, wear the hat. And I was like, OK, that's. <laughs> That's what I've come to expect. So uh, <laughs> just a little anecdote there. And and you know what? That keeping us honest as, as you know, from the male perspective, I need that in my life because I go a week without it. And all of a sudden I'm walking around with my chest puffed out on my toes like I'm some big deal. And I'm not. Uh, so <laughs> and, and you kind of sit right there in the middle, like you said, the hornet's nest. So you're always around these ladies and, and they do knock you down a peg or two, it sounds like. I think anybody just was ready just to go for it, you know, at any given time. And that's just the seat you get to sit in. So, uh, so you kind of just have to watch for the bullets flying and, and just, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a little comical because once you fire back, they're like, well, that's harsh. Uh, yeah. like, well, hold on. <laughs> I make one comment back and now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the end of the world. But hold on. Uh, Sherry's always got my back though. So I appreciate that. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, even Leslie loves to keep me, uh, keep me humble at, at home so uh there, there's never an oppor- no 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 uh no opportunities left wasted good well <laughs> I, I mean look behind every great man is a, is a great woman and uh and we'll get to to that here in just a moment but i did want to mention that uh you know talking to patty uh with her military background and the amount of military she's gotten her family and all the experience i don't think i'd cross patty i think that's one that i'd smile and be very very nice to every chance i got <laughs> yeah, you know, you get you get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I started off the show talking about some of the women in my life. Obviously, my wife gets mentioned on this podcast all the time, but I, I did want to uh, take the time and thank my mom and my sister for all the support uh, that they've given me over the years. You know, the, the job that I do, uh, you kind of put yourself out there and hope. And there's been a lot of those days where I'm looking in the mirror And if it's just me talking to Marcus, um, I quit and I'm going to go drive truck or do something like that, that uh, (laughs) nobody gets to see me and I get to be like my own person. But I had a lot of conversations with my mom and my sister. They're very encouraging. And as I said, behind every great man is a is a great woman um, running the show at home. I want to give you the floor to say anything you'd like about your wonderful wife. I was fortunate enough to meet her when I was in Omaha. Uh, Super nice woman. So anything you'd like to say to Leslie, just in case she happens to tune into this podcast. Oh, just in case. So we're going to make sure we send it to her. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we'll text it. <laughs> absolutely. You know, the uh, the benefit of having someone that's, uh, you know, just a strong support system is they're, they're, they're there to, to keep you humble, but, you know, pick you up. You know, the other day she came, she came over to me and she's like, I really don't know how you keep it all together between the four companies. And she's like, you just do such an impressive job at the end of the day. And, and so she, they're, they're as, as, as much fun and as, uh, as hard as they can get on you too. And, uh, to, to keep you humble they're uh they're there to say hey by the way like yeah what you know every 
every 500 times, maybe they, they make a comment like, Hey, by the way, you're, <laughs> this is actually pretty impressive. <laughs> so they, keep, they, they give you that little boost of, of, of light. You're like, Oh, this is what it feels like to be, <laughs> to be a, you know, praised. Yeah. It's a lot like golf. When you hit a hundred bad shots and one good one, you're like, I can get out there and play again yeah, next week. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I love golf. Like, yeah, this is, this is how it's, I, I, I don't, I don't get to play, play much golf. You know, I got two kids, a wife and, uh, and then I say my, my, my second children, which is all the company. Um, but you know, I, I played golf a few weeks ago and I shot like an 82. I'm like, Oh, this is what it feels like. This is okay. All right. And I'm like, that's a, and my friend's like, yeah, that's how it hooks you. Like, don't you want to keep playing? I'm like, hell no. Like, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's only worse. <laughs> and I can prove that it makes you feel that way because this is the second time you've told me about that 82. So, I mean, that's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, exactly. It doesn't... But, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've got a special special person within Leslie. Uh, uh, she, gets to ha- she gets to handle me when I'm up until God knows when in the morning. Uh, and then, you know, and then, she, you know, keep in your mind like, hey, shut off for a minute and pay attention, you know, keep you, it's, you know, when you find someone like that, that can say, like, keep you in check. It's just, it's still powerful uh, it's as much as I, it, you know, make sure that you're always, all, you know, checking all the boxes for everybody, right? Like, yeah, it's work and, you, you know, you can spend so much time on it, but, you know, I also, I also want to be a good husband and a good father, a good, good son. So, you know, you, and she, she does a phenomenal job on making sure, uh, uh, I, I, I stay within those boxes as much as possible, even though there's no such thing as a box in this world. It's just when the phone rings, you answer it, but you know, how it goes. Well said, <laughs> well said there. And, and, uh, from all of us here at the H and M trucking podcast to Leslie, thank you so much for keeping him in check for, uh, and, and for also being such a great wife and a great mother. Uh, this has been such a cool episode because I feel like the women behind H and M really do deserve a tip of the cap there's a great culture and outstanding workplace to be a part of. Um, and I just feel lucky to uh, to get to talk to all of them, just like I feel lucky to get to talk to you. So uh, there he is, president of H&M Trucking, James Fonda. Thanks for joining us again this week, man. I guess we should check in before I let you go real quick. How's the foot? Uh, you know, it's hanging in there. It's uh, we're, we're on the up and up. I've been, I think it gave me, uh, I've been sick now for like 12 days. So I don't know if that came from the bacteria from that or whatnot. So now I'm, finally fighting that off with some z packs so you know it's just one thing after another <laughs> it is it is like i said last time you know next time i'll let you step on this here too and i'm gonna watch from the shore <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and like i said last time free trip to hawaii man i'm in i'll i'll be grabbing those things and chucking them all over the beach if that's what you need let's do it let's, let's, <laughs> let's just put it all over your back let's, let's just see how how much we can do in one go <laughs> uh, all right thanks for joining us james have a great day later Great stuff there from James, as always. I want to thank everybody that stopped by to listen to the podcast today. Don't forget to interact with us on all those social media posts that you see. Comment, like, share it, do all those things. But if you want to hear something specific or if there's someone you would like to hear from in particular, we would love to hear about it. Interact with us. Uh, Check us out on Facebook by going to the H&M Trucking Facebook page, and you'll see everything that we have to offer there. I'm really excited about the way that this podcast is evolving and growing into something that uh, has a little bit of substance, or as as Grant, my, my boss, likes to say, a little bit of meat on the bone. Next week on the show, we are going to have a Father's Day special. So you heard from all the ladies behind H&M this week. We're going to tip our caps to the dads coming up next week, so stay tuned for that. I want to thank Deanna from Driver Advocacy. I want to thank Lori Chilton from joining us from Nashville on her way to Missouri. I want to thank Brenda Hampton and Patty Roop. And then, of course, once again, I'll mention him, James. uh, Great contributions to the podcast today. And without these great people telling me all their stories and talking to me about their jobs and their daily lives, I would not be able to do this So big ups from this guy right here. Thank you once again for joining us. Stay safe out there, drivers. Keep the shiny. Did I say shiny? Keep the shiny side up. Sorry, I was just thinking about my tagline. Stay fresh, cheese bags. Thank you for listening to the H&M Trucking Podcast. Please leave a review, subscribe, and connect with Marcus over at the H&M Trucking social media channels. 
And if you're considering a job at H&M, find us at hmtrucking.com. Until next time, stay safe and ahead of the curve drivers.